You entered the dream they've all been having, didn't you? How much do you know about Leonard? Leonard? Who's Leonard? Ah, uh, whatever. I have bigger fish to fry. I've discovered something far more important. And far more terrifying. What? The stars. The sky. It's all a gigantic hoax. A lie. This is the line that changed everything we know about the world of Tivat. For those of you who weren't playing the game in its early days, this footage came from a limited event known as Unreconciled Stars, and focused heavily on our only astrologer Mona, as well as Scaramouche. The event goes a bit like this. A shower of meteors covers the entirety of Mondstadt and Liwa, scattering small shards everywhere. These shards lull anyone who touches them into a deep sleep from which they cannot wake up. The Traveler is sent to investigate, along with Fischl, and is able to wake up some of the afflicted by removing the meteorites from the area. Eventually, the Traveler ditches Fischl, or, well, Fischl ditches the Traveler, and Mona's help is enlisted instead. With her assistance, we learn that all the sleeping people are having the exact same dream, because the meteorite isn't just a rock, it's someone's constellation. The Stella Fortuna. And yes, I'm talking about the same Stella Fortuna you get when you summon a duplicate character during a wish. We're talking about those constellations. Anyway, eventually we find the core constellation, as well as Scaramouche, who for some reason was able to enter the meteor's dream and wake himself from it without any assistance. When confronted, he says this now infamous line, the stars, the sky, it's all a gigantic hoax, a lie. Of course, he could be lying to us, being a harbinger and all, but Mona basically confirms immediately afterwards that the whole false sky thing is something astrologers are actually aware of. Although she does preface this by wondering if there may be more to it than she initially thought. It, well, great, so the sky is fake, but what does that really mean? To answer that, we'll have to take a closer look at the oddities of the Tevat sky. First up, the moon. The always full moon. And no, before you put anything in that comment box, this is not a game engine restriction thing. Games have had lunar cycles even before the N64's generation. Not putting in a lunar cycle is a choice, a design choice. The fact that Tevat only has full moons matters. See, if the moon is always full, it means that it's not orbiting around the Earth, or it means that it's orbiting around the Earth at a speed that matches the Earth's rotation around the Sun, which is practically unheard of. Personally, I think the former is more likely. To back this up, there's this book in-game called The Moonlit Bamboo Forest Volume 3, which mentions the fact that Tevat once had not one, but three moons. It specifically says, The three sisters of the night turned against one another, leading to their eternal parting by death. Only one of their pale corpses now remains, ever shedding its cold light. Blah 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 blah. I could go on and on about how Three Moon Sisters parallel the concept of the fates from Norse and Greek mythology, or how the Triketra being a recurring symbol of the moon as well as a symbol of a trinity, and what the possible implications of that are, but that's another video. For now, let's focus on the fact that there were possibly three moons, but now there's only one, and all three moons were or are technically dead, but one is somehow still hanging in the sky? Man, that's morbid. So these moons, uh, died, apparently, during a great calamity. But can you guess which calamity? That's right, it was the fall of Conria 500 years ago. In fact, we know this is the case because that calamity was the most recent on record. And we can actually confirm that there were at least two moons present at that time. 
In the We Will Be Reunited trailer, we see Lumine running with a blood moon behind her. But in game literature states that many times, Conria's fall occurred during a solar eclipse or during a black sun. But a blood moon is a lunar eclipse. And the thing is, you can't have a solar and lunar eclipse at the same time with only one moon. If both eclipses took place, as we assume they did at the same time, then there were two moons as recently as 500 years ago. And yet now we only have one. And we can actually confirm this to be the case because of Danesleaf's official introduction card which has this to say. The confluence between the past and future. The original calamity had been overturned, yet the island and the sky set the earth to burn. Chalk pursues gold in this time inopportune. The eclipse is swallowed by the crimson moon. But here's the thing. As cool as this whole missing moon business is, we can't actually prove the existence of three moons. We can only prove that there were two. Probably. And based on several other books and some of the in-game currency, we do know that there used to be moon phases, and now there aren't, since there are references to events that only take place during a new moon. See the Welkin. This leads me to believe that there may have only been two moons in Tavat, and the third moon may be a completely different moon altogether. Like a false moon hanging in the sky. And the myth surrounding three moons would have been an explanation as to why two moons suddenly disappeared and then a third took its place. Possibly. Need further proof? Well, how about this? Eh? Eh? Yeah, that's pretty weird. The moon looks extremely close when it's put into context like this. And no, this isn't a bug. But we're assuming it's not a bug. The game's been out for almost a year at the time of this video, and if it was a bug, it's a pretty noticeable one, and I think that MiHoYo would have patched this one by now. And speaking of things that could be a bug or limitation of the game world technologically, have you ever looked up at the sky at night? Like, directly up? The stars in the sky at night have this bizarre mandala-like pattern. And granted, this could just be the way the star map is laid out in-game, and it is a limitation of the system, but the patterns look really deliberate to me. I feel like it would be a lot easier for the stars to be randomly distributed in a more flat pattern than to have this really deliberate, regular mandala dome shape. But maybe that's just me. And to take this a little bit further, you know, stars wouldn't naturally line up like this. And so I have to wonder, is it possible then that someone has made them align in such a way? And if the stars of Tuvat were anything like the stars of our world, they'd be enormous balls of gas millions of light years away and extremely difficult to force into a unique pattern to match up with the fate of every human every time one of them is born. I mean, there's millions or billions of us. But here's the thing. Tuvat's stars aren't Balls of gas. They're rocks. Remember when we found the core of Leonard's constellation in the Unreconciled Stars event? It was a rock. A pretty small rock for something that's supposed to pass as a star millions of light years away. Yes, thank you, Mona, for this information that I still don't understand how you know. For us to be able to see such a tiny rock as a bright light in the sky and read them through means like Mona's hydromancy in our horoscopes is kind of an incredible thing. Unless they're a lot closer to us than we thought they were. 
Forget millions of light years, these rocks are likely only a few miles overhead, or less. Even Mona finds this exceptionally odd as she believes that the stars are much farther away. Okay, so we've established that it's no longer speculation that the stars are suspicious rock formations hanging or levitating in the sky. We also know that a person's constellation determines their destiny, typically at birth. Again, we get confirmation from Mona on this through not just dialogue, but the fact that she literally reads the natal charts of all of the in-game characters. If you have a Mona, check her idol animation, you'll see what I mean. But destiny aside, unreconciled stars also taught us that the constellation rocks, or the Stella Fortuna, also hold the memories of the person they belong to. Case in point, anyone who approached even a fragment of Leonard's constellation fell unconscious and unwillingly had to witness his memories or will from when he was alive. It's been four version updates since this event. I have been thinking about the false sky for four version updates and it's been driving me insane because I haven't been able to actually put together a theory on it that had any foundation whatsoever that I could back up. And then Ishdaha dropped. And when he did, I realized that there is something else in Tevat that holds memories, just like the constellations. In fact, there's something in Tavat that holds all of the memories of everything that's ever been, ever. And that thing is the ley lines. Now I'll be going into ley lines in depth in another video because they're really complicated. But for now, let's think of ley lines as something like the circulatory system of the planet. If you think of the planet as if it was a person, then ley lines are effectively the blood vessels in the artery that carry blood, or energy, throughout the entire body, or in this case, planet. The energy then gets pumped through these lines by the Irman soul, or the world tree, which kind of regulates the entire system, kind of like the human heart, or at least that's how I understand it for now. And like I said, ley lines carry energy, not blood. But that energy carries with it all of the memories of the thing that the energy came from before it returned to the ley lines. Thus, the ley line becomes a constant flow of cumulative memories of basically everything that's ever existed. It's like a data stream or your Facebook feed, which is full of way too much information. It's the same thing. Okay, not really. I'm sorry. Okay. So, ley lines contain the memory of all things. And we now know that constellations can do the same thing, but only for their respective person and post-mortem. But they're still different, right? I mean, ley lines are more like veins of raw energy and constellations are apparently rocks. It seems like a bit of a stretch for them to be considered the same thing. Or is it? There are actually two instances of rocks tying back to the ley lines. The first I already mentioned with Ejdaha. In his quest, we learned that not only was Ejdaha a sentient rock before he became a giant dragon, but he also knows how to read the ley lines and the, the ley lines sustain him somehow. He feeds on their energy. And we also learned that certain types of non sentient rocks can also hold some memories, just like the ley lines, although what they can hold is a little bit limited. And then we got the energy amplifier event, where we were introduced to a completely new concept called the Irman Soul Fruit Fragment, which by the way, looks a hell of a lot like the constellation rocks from unreconciled stars. Just saying. Now remember that Irman soul trees are technically like branches of the world tree, which is connected to all of the ley lines that flow through the earth. 
And if that tree produces a crystalline fruit, it wouldn't be a stretch to assume that those fruits also contain memories from the ley lines that the Irmin soul are connected to. Perhaps not the memories of specific people, but just specific memories. That could be how they boost our elemental abilities in combat. We're drawing on memories to improve the way we fight, but since those memories are external and belong to the fruits, when we are no longer in possession of them physically, we lose access to those abilities. So if ley lines and Irminsul fruit are in fact connected to the Stella Fortuna, what does that tell us about a possible false sky? Well, consider the possibility that a destiny is just an inverted memory. For example, if I remember something that's happened to me in the past, it's because it happened to me in the past. It's an absolute fact. It's something that happened. But a destiny is something that hasn't happened yet, but will. It is an assumed fact. In a world where people's belief in something like destiny is so strong, it could be functioning like a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, a constellation influences the person it belongs to in order to ensure that the desired outcome truly does come to pass. It's destined. I would like to propose that Irminsul Fruit and the Stella Fortuna are just about one and the same thing. Someone or something is creating or harvesting Irminsul fruit and hanging them in the sky in a formation that creates a person's constellation and therefore their destiny. But if those fruits are in the sky, then the Irminsul likely can't reach them or recycle the memories that they contain, which in turn would mean that there's less energy available in the ley lines themselves. To reuse the circulatory system metaphor, the world is bleeding out and there's no blood transfusion in sight because someone is using all the blood to write instructions for mankind in the sky. Sorry, that was a little gross. Anyway, this is kind of a problem because energy itself cannot be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. If you take these memories out of the recycling system, then they never become something new, which means souls can't reincarnate, quote unquote, because they're stuck in the sky, so only new souls can be created from what's left over, and that means you could technically take the memories of a dead person or their constellation and revive them? Maybe that's what they did to Chi Chi? Now with all this information, one question remains. Who made the false sky? And why? Okay, sorry, that's two questions. Two questions remain. And before we can answer those, let's take a look at how the sky possibly functions. Given that the stars are close to Tavat, likely barely outside the its atmosphere, and the moon never changes phases and therefore is somehow always perpendicular to the sun or isn't orbiting the earth and Tifat still seems to have a day-night cycle, I have reached one conclusion. Tevat is a planet inside of an astrolabe. Why an astrolabe, you ask? Because an astrolabe would put the earth at the center. That means the sun, the moon, and the stars all orbit around the Earth, which remains stationary. This would allow for a barrier of sorts to be erected around the planet and for the expected heavenly bodies to be placed in artificial orbits around it. And believe it or not, there's actually some additional in-game evidence to support this. First, let's take a look at these giant sundials. This one is a little debatable, but to me, they look quite a bit like an astrolabe. Don't see it? Well, let's take a look at Ningguang's constellation. Did you know that it's not actually a ballista, but an astrolabe? In Chinese, her constellation is called Armillary Sphere Apparatus Constellation. And an armillary sphere is also known as a spherical astrolabe. Also note that the pattern on the inside of the so-called sundial seems to match the mandala pattern of the stars we looked at earlier. Anyway, there's also an astrolabe on Jean's, sorry, Varka's desk. 
why is this here? And let's not forget about this thing that's drawn on the mural in Dragonspine that a lot of people are saying looks like an atom. This could very well be a diagram of an astrolabe, a planet at the center with artificial orbits around it. Heck, even Mona uses an astrolabe for her hydromancy. And by the by, this cannot be the chart that she uses. The chart from her idol animation is a near perfect match for that of a normal natal chart. In fact, you can actually see this astrolabe. She uses it for both her skill as well as her burst. And then the icing on top of this million layered cake is Celestia. Yes, that big old island of doom in the sky, which we'll just zoom in on a little closer, a little closer, and there we go. Now, for the record, this is an in-game sprite of Celestia data mined from the current version of the game, and it's upscaled a bit so we can see it a little better. And what do we have at the very tip top of the tower? That looks a lot like an astrolabe to me. Now I know it seems a little bit obvious, but this means that Celestia could very well be responsible for creating a false sky around Tavat and structuring the world in the same manner as an astrolabe. Why? Because they could surround Tavat with a controllable destiny, the constellations. But why do a thing like that? The sustainer of heavenly principles tells us outright in the first few minutes of the game. Humans got too arrogant. Free will became a problem. In order to keep them in line, humans were given rules to live by, destinies to fulfill, a purpose to exist for, and visions to strengthen that belief in the divine power. There may even be further proof of this in the fall of Conria. For you see, their unique art of Chemia was a type of alchemy that could create life from nothing. Or so it would seem. What they actually did was create life by pulling energy straight from the ley lines. A power that has thus far been reserved for the gods. And when man obtains the powers of God, are they not then a god themselves? Certainly sounds arrogant to me. And all of this because of some careless musings of some short stack and a big hat. Who'd have thunk, eh, Scaramouche? So what do you guys think? Is the sky actually fake? Did Mihoyo just forget about the placement of the moon and stars? Is it all just a coincidence? Let me know down in the comment section below, and until next time, I'm gonna go have a nice long nap. Yeah.